Hello, I'm George Middleton. Welcome to Deconstructing Race, a critical thought podcast where we deconstruct race and its social issues like this. A country emerging from protests of pain. Hands up! After the killing of George Floyd. I cannot breathe. Viral moments of racial bias caught on tape. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. And the deadly shooting of Ahmaud Arbery. Race, a social construct of chaos, resulting in learned behaviors that can be unlearned by challenging our system of beliefs. Let's begin. Welcome to Deconstructing Race, where we take topical and relevant issues affecting the country and deconstruct race from the equation. On this episode, the topic is race, religion, and politics, the polygamy of ideologies. Why do white Christians vote Republican and black Christians vote Democrat? Everyone knows conservative Christians vote Republican. It's like one of the rules of nature. The sun comes up in the east and conservative Christians vote Republican. Unless they're black. Oh right, most African Americans self-identify as Christian and most African Americans vote Democrat. Look at the numbers. In 2016, 81% of white evangelical Christians voted for Donald Trump. For many Christians, it's just assumed the Republican Party is the party for Christians. But what about black Christians? Pew Research interviewed validated voters after the 2016 election. People they could verify actually voted. When they looked at black Protestant Christians, there is no official category for black evangelicals because most pollsters have decided evangelical is a white term, but that's a whole different video. When we look at black Protestant Christians, 96% voted for Hillary Clinton, the Democrat. 96%. So 81% of white evangelical Christians voted for Trump and 96% of black Protestant Christians voted for Clinton. And it's pretty much like that in every election. White evangelicals vote Republican and black Protestants vote Democrat. Why is that? Don't they read the same Bible, pray to the same God? Which group doesn't understand that they're voting for the wrong party? That was Philip Roger Vischer, an American filmmaker, composer, animator, speaker, and actor. He makes some very thought-provoking observations in his question on why do white Christians vote Republican and black Christians vote Democrat. Here are some questions that come to mind. What is the difference between a black Christian and a white Christian? What is the difference between a black conservative and a white conservative. And for that matter, what is the difference between black and white? To effectively answer these questions with clarity, it's important that we have a good understanding of the ideological context that we're having this discussion in. A political party It's common for members of a party to hold similar ideas about politics, and parties may promote specific ideological or policy goals. A religious group. They are a set of individuals whose identity as such is distinctive in terms of common religious creed, beliefs, doctrines, practices, and rituals. Theoretically, there should be no pattern of color in an activity such as voting in politics when it comes to Christianity. If anything, the collective behavior of the Christian of all skin tones should look different than the politics. But it doesn't. Why? When it comes to race, many of us are not so clear on the context of that ideology. Race is an ideology. Racial classification systems were developed by the European when he explored and colonized the globe and found that there were physical differences between people. 
These systems were used to justify colonization, conversion, slavery, and genocide. According to these systems, white skin was the standard, and dark skin was associated with intellectual inferiority and slowed development. When viewed in this historical context, the answer then becomes quite clear as to the differences between the white Christian and the black Christian, and the white conservative and the black conservative. And that answer is experiences. For race ideology was designed for human beings of different skin tones to have completely opposite experiences over the same phenomena. Let's explore the phenomena of religion as it pertains to the African who was brought here forcibly to the Americas and their early experiences being introduced to the oppressor's form of faith. European colonizers justified slavery through the Bible. There was this idea that biblically through the story of Noah's curse, Africans were meant to be slaves. But black slaves also went on to adopt Christianity and make it into a faith for survival and mobilization. What we know as the black church today formed through what happened during slavery and the period after it. Now, slaveholders didn't really want their slaves to be exposed to Christianity. There was a fear that by exposing them to it, they'd see themselves as well equal to the slaveholder since they would share the same faith. So they adjusted their faith's teachings. The version of Christianity that slaveholders spread usually mandated a divinely ordained racial hierarchy. That slavery was God's will for people of African descent. And it's not like the stolen Africans didn't have their own spiritual traditions before they were enslaved in the colonies. I'll let Dr. Judith Weisenfeld of Princeton University explain. Enslaved Africans were not interested in converting to Christianity, for example. Um, enslaved peoples produced religious community on their own, maintaining connections to African traditional resources, and creating new versions of those. Their own beliefs include a variety of traditional religions in West Africa and Central Africa, but also Islam and Christianity, and they ended up practicing their faith in secret gatherings. But in the 1740s, decades before the United States even existed, a wave of religious enthusiasm among European Protestants spread across the colonies. It's known as the Great Awakening. The Christian revivals, as they were called, focused on renewed individual piety and religious devotion, and they had a more egalitarian message than the one that slaveholders espoused. People felt free to interpret the scripture and the teachings of Christianity for themselves in ways that highlighted their humanity, their equal standing before God, and the notion that God would someday liberate them. And so we begin to see um, a new forms of African American Christianity emerge that are focused on this experience of being born again and on a more direct access that doesn't require the oversight of white clergy. It's out of this movement that you start to see the emergence of black leaders. A lot of them came out of the Baptist and Methodist denominations because those denominations actually licensed black men to preach. And Weisenfeld says sometimes religion even provided tools for slave revolts. One of the most famous examples that comes much later is that of Nat Turner, a religious visionary and preacher who led a rebellion in Virginia in August of 1831. Now, back in the late 1700s, free black people in the North had already begun to develop their own denominations. In many cases, these denominations were in direct response to the racism black Americans experienced in their predominantly white congregations. But it wasn't until after the Civil War and the end of slavery that newly freed black people who were part of the Baptist churches and communities in the South were were able to organize more formally. When the National Baptist Convention was founded in 1895, it became the nation's largest African-American denomination with almost two million members. So why is all of this important? Well, these new institutions became central spaces for black organizing and public discussion of issues like the abolition of slavery and then later the status of free black people. It gave them a means to mobilize against their oppression. Control of, um, of religious life was always fraught under slavery, but it was sometimes the only arena in which people could exercise authority and control. Black preachers, black ministers, 
Other kinds of black religious leaders have always been central figures in black communities. During the Great Migration, millions of Southern black people moved to northern cities in search of better opportunities and to escape the Jim Crow South. It's estimated that between 1916 and 1970, more than 6 million black Americans left their homes in the South and relocated to northern cities. This influx of Southerners not only transformed northern black Protestant churches, but also created interactions that would offer black Americans a range of religious beliefs outside of Christianity. In our interview, Weisenfeld notes that out of the Great Migration came two major revivalist movements that identified Islam as the proper religion of black people, the Moorish Science Temple and the Nation of Islam. While Islam was one of the religions of African slaves, it kind of disappeared as a conscious faith in practice because slaves were forced to practice in secret. And it was through the work of Muslim missionaries, scholars, and activists that versions of Islam began to reemerge in black communities in the early 20th century, versions that reflected the fight against white supremacy and a search for independence. A lot of those immigrant preachers propagated the idea of universal brotherhood, an idea that appealed to many black Americans. Noble Drew Ali, who is considered the father of the first modern black Muslim movement, established the Moorish Science Temple in the early 1900s. The Moorish Science Temple rejected the idea of tolerating white supremacy through the black church and rejected the idea of black inferiority. The temple didn't reject Christianity, but it did see it as a European religion. Among the temple's central beliefs was the idea that black Americans were descendants of Moroccans and that their original faith was Islam. Ali rejected terms of the day like Negro, colored, and even black, believing that the term more was more accurate. The Moorish Science Temple had thousands of members in the 1920s across northern cities like Detroit and Philadelphia. And it's important to note that it was far from mainstream or orthodox Islam. Even the Quran used by the temple was written by Ali and derived from various sources. While the Moorish Science Temple was taking root, a man named Waz Farth Muhammad established another non-orthodox black Islamic movement in 1930, one that you're probably familiar with, the Nation of Islam. The world sees the problem in America as some gang-banging, dope-selling, crack-using black people. Yeah. The nation's purpose was, according to Waz Farid Muhammad, to use the faith to uplift black Americans and make them self-reliant. And it was under the leadership of Elijah Muhammad, who assumed leadership in 1934, that the nation grew into a great political force. I represent to you, not a puppet, Yes, sir. But I represent to you God in person. Yes, yes, sir! It created one of the most influential black liberation figures of the 20th century. We don't advocate violence, but our people have been the constant victims of brutality on the part of America's racists, and the government has found itself either unwilling or unable to do anything about it. Malcolm X, a minister in the Nation of Islam, propagated a simple message, uplift black Americans' worth in their own eyes and make them independent. And the Nation of Islam was the foundation of his message, especially as it rejected Christianity and how it had been used by white supremacy. Religion, whether Islam or Christianity, was a big deal during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Religious spaces like mosques and churches became mobilization centers. Because churches and mosques were community centers and financially independent, they were also places where people were able to learn skills like public speaking, fundraising, and organizing meetings. And it's also why so many of the leaders of the civil rights movement were either ministers or active members in their churches and mosques. There were also efforts by the likes of ministers and theologians like James H. Cohn to create a black liberation theology. In a 2017 talk at the Yale Divinity School, Cohn summarized the core of black theology in this way. Black power is not only alien to the gospel, is not alien to the gospel, but rather it is the gospel of Jesus in 20th century America. Was the oppressor's form of religion for the benefit of the African? Did the African embrace the oppressor's Christianity willingly or out of survival? Why was the African prohibited from practicing his own authentic form of faith? Let's explore the origin of Christianity from the other side of the racial coin white. Robert P. Jones is the CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute and also author of the new book White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. Uh, Robert, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it.
Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm great. I'm really glad to be here. So let's uh, just 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 to get us into this topic. Can you talk a little bit about I mean, how how far back does the um, uh, interplay or overlap between white supremacy and American Christianity go? And is it a specific to certain denominations? That's a great yeah opener. Um, well, it goes all the way back, um, you know, is, is the thing there is to say, I mean, all the way back to the founding of, of the Republic. And in fact, you know what the the version of uh, kind of particularly white Protestant Christianity that lands on American shores, um, you know, brings with it this entanglement with white supremacy, really from its European uh, European roots. Um, so things like Manifest Destiny, uh, the idea that white Europeans are entitled to Native American lands, all the way from the very beginning. I mean, these are very much wrapped up with um, this uh, entanglement of of the idea that kind of white. Uh, white people are meant to be over others in kind of a racial hierarchy, and that this was legitimated by Christian belief, and it kind of brought and kind of came over, legitimated and packaged in uh, in a kind of white Christian theological package. Uh, when we look at the um, the Northern Baptist Southern Baptist split, which is something that has been written about from a number of different angles o- over the years. Um, how much was that split related to this issue of white supremacy? Yeah, well, it was it was the reason uh, really that, uh, you know, Baptist in the North and Baptist in the South parted ways. It, it was literally over whether a uh, ordained member of the clergy could enslave other human beings on the basis of the color of their skin and still uh, you know, retain their status as a as a clergy person, and that whether this was a legitimately Christian thing to do. And Baptists in the North rejected that view. Baptists in the South were so dedicated uh, to protecting, um, you know, not only this possibility but this as a Christian norm uh, that they literally split from their Northern brethren, set up their own um, you know convention called the Southern Baptist Convention. That's where that name comes from uh, in 1845. So this is well before um, you know, even the Civil War. Um, uh, this is my home denomination, I should say, and that I, I grew up in, uh, in, as a Southern Baptist in Mississippi. Um, and uh, but, you know, that history, I think is one of the reasons why I wrote the book is, is um, that history is not well known, really. I mean, even even I growing up inside the church didn't find out about it until I was in seminary. So in my early in my early 20s. Uh, but the one thing to say to answer the first part of your question to your first question is that while I think this history is most um, kind of on the surface with a with an organization like the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, virtually every Protestant denomination split um, over the issue of slavery and white supremacy um, in the Civil War. The Methodist split, the Presbyterian split, the Episcopalians, uh, you know, split, split, um, and it was all really over this question um, of the legitimacy of, of of slavery, and then underneath that, the kind of you know bigger thing that um, that justifies that this idea um, of white of white supremacy it, it is or to what degree is the Catholic Church sort of uh, exempt from this? I mean, I know you said that this was predominantly um, in, in Protestant uh, churches, but what about the Catholic Church? Right. Uh, really important as well. I mean, what we find is that, um, you know, despite the fact that the Catholics have their own history of discrimination, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, there's a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment. You know, as late as John F. Kennedy's, um, you know, presidential election, he was facing a lot of anti-Catholic uh, sentiment in in 1960. But um, you know, it, it's worth saying too that, but in the latter years, um, this this problem really exists. Um, it actually exists, you know, through the Catholic Church as well. So, for example, even in New York, um, you know, uh, not in the South, uh, but in New York City, um, you know, there was one Catholic parish as as African Americans begin to move in numbers from the South to New York. Um, as part of the Great Migration, they were displacing, in many cases, um, Irish neighborhoods, Polish neighborhoods, Italian neighborhoods, and pushing uh, folks um, out. And, and they actually left because they didn't want to live alongside um, African Americans. And, and, the, and then even the, the diocese in, um, in New York designated one diocese, St. Mark's Parish, or one, one parish, uh, St. Mark's Parish, uh, as the place for African Americans to go. So in other words, if you were white in New York, you could go to your local parish school, um, if you wanted to go to Catholic school. But if you were African-American, there was one school you had to go to. They had segregated all African-Americans into one school. African-Americans often had to wait uh, uh, at the end of the line until all whites had received the Eucharist uh, at a mass before they could receive Eucharist. And this is, again, in Catholic churches in New York. Uh, So it really has infected, uh, really, not only kind of evangelicals in the South or mainline uh, Protestants in the Midwest, but also Catholics um, that are more 
numerous in urban and northeastern settings. Uh, I'm guessing that the answer to this question, I'm guessing there are multiple answers to this question that that may vary. But what have been some of the biblical justifications for for slavery mm. and then short of slavery, discrimination or, or out, outward racism? Yeah, um, you know, I, so I spent a whole ch chapter in the book talking about the kind of theology and kind of how this creeps in uh, and is embedded in, in in white Christian theology. One of the most um, blatant examples um, really is that um, white um, Christians really invented a separate creation story uh, for black and brown people that was separate from the creation story uh, for white people. So uh, in, and, and read this back into the book of Genesis. And uh, it was in the story of um, Cain and Abel. These are um, two brothers. Cain kills his brother Abel because he's jealous and then lies to God about the murder. Um, and in the, in the text, it says that God marks him, kind of you know, marks him uh, as a result. Now, the text doesn't say anything about skin color or race or any, any of that. But white theologians and clergy and white Christians in general read back into that passage. Aha, here's the beginning of dark skinned people. Um, that's their origin story. Now, that conveniently um, right, traces then whites back to Adam and Eve to these kind of more noble human beings uh, that God formed by God's own hands and breathed life into them, uh, and, and then traces the origin story of um, non-white peoples in the world, literally to a criminal act. Um, that is, that is the, you know, to a murder. Um, and so it, it, it sets up a kind of not only kind of racial hierarchy, but a moral hierarchy with whites having this more noble history and non-whites having this, um, you know, history that again goes back to an original ancestor who is literally a murderer. More recently, um, and but you know, during the 20th century, so to speak, uh, we started to see groups like the KKK uh, come to prominence in certain parts of the country, and uh, it, the 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 identity of the KKK as a Christian group is something that is much discussed and to different extents debated. But for, as my understanding uh, uh, remains today they at least self identify as as a Christian group. Can you talk a little bit about that and the relationship between the KKK and particular denominations? Uh, sure. You know, they it, it, it's worth noting that that's exactly right, that the KKK um, was very um, explicitly Christian. Um, they, and, and to be very specific, they were Protestant Christian. Um, right. So what's what's lost often as you know, people think about them burning crosses against African-Americans in the country. But uh, what's worth remembering is that they were not only an anti-black organization, uh, but they also saw Jews and Catholics as a threat uh, to, a, to a Protestant America that they were out to defend. I mean, they were very explicitly defending a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant version of, of America. Um, and, you know, so and so they they were uh, yeah, they they were very vehemently anti-Catholic, saw them as a threat to democracy and anti-Jewish, um, you know, as well. Uh, so a lot of anti-Semitism, anti-Catholicism, anti you know, really traces its way back there. And I think the thing that that survives and sort of like is more diffuse um, in in uh, particularly white Protestant circles is this is this melding of white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism with American identity, right? I think that this is one of the things we're still struggling with today. That, that white Christians in many ways, and particularly white Protestants, historically saw themselves as America, right? Um, and, and, and so the, with the changing demographics of the country today, uh, white Christians today, for example, um, are only 44% of the country. That's if you take all of them together. And just a decade ago, they were 54% uh, percent of the country. So this is a quite recent sea change that we've been through. And I think some of the um, visceral things in our politics, and particularly, I think, the appeal of of Trump, when he has talked to white Christians in particular, has been to appeal to this white Anglo-Saxon Protestant version of America that he is standing in to protect uh, from change as the country is shifting um, uh, quite dramatically over the last 10 or 15 years. La last thing I want to touch on speaking now in, in the modern era, you know, in the right now and over the last 10 to 15 years, what is the landscape like in terms of denominationally? the sort of more uh, integrated and uh, a progressive, for lack of a better term, Protestant denominations versus on the other side, the ones that still maintain more of the segregation and division. Yeah, 
Well, you know, I'd like to say they were uh, that that I had found in, in my research a, a great deal more distinction than I in fact found. I think this is one of the more surprising findings of the book is mm. that um, despite the fact that if you look at the denominational level and you look at like statements, for example, that denominations have put out, the mainline Protestant denominations that are part of the National Council of Churches, for example, have put out lots of statements about racial justice, about Black Lives Matter those kinds of things that if you just read those statements, you would think that the domination is those denominations are kind of way over here. Yeah. Um, whereas you've heard much less from the national association of evangelicals, for example, um, and, and other evangelical, the Southern Baptist convention, other, other groups, you've heard much less from them. But the thing is, if you get away from those elite actors and you look at actually people in the pews, um, as we've done in national public opinion surveys, um, just real quickly, example, um, I developed in the book a thing I called a racism index, which is a measure of um, attitudes about structural racism across 15 different questions. And if you use a metric like that, and I, I scored that index on a scale of one to 10, um, it's maybe not that surprising with 10 being holding the most racist attitudes that white evangelicals score eight out of 10 um, on that index. But here's what's surprising is that white mainline Protestants, again, these are Episcopalians, Presbyterians, uh, United Church of Christ and Methodists. Um, uh, scored seven out of 10 on that hmm. same index, and as did white Catholics. White Catholics scored seven out of 10. And if you take whites who are not um, religiously, un- are, are not Christian, they only score four um, out of 10 on the same index. So the big divider really among white Americans today is Christian identity. And Christian identity moves average white people further away, actually, from the concerns of racial justice that African Americans have have in the country. That was one of the more remarkable, I think, findings in the book is just that distance uh, and, and that it is really it is Christian identity that really is doing the work of kind of moving uh, whites um, who are Christian further away um, from the concerns of African Americans than whites who are not. That's it. Do you out of curiosity, do you have numbers on that scale for, for example, uh, Mormons, Jews and Muslims? So um, we don't have enough for Mormons. Or they weren't big enough to break out, and we don't have enough for, for Jews and Muslims individually. But when we break out, we put together like non-Christian religious people, so Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists. Um, uh, I don't remember the numbers straight out, but they are further, much further down the scale than white Christians are um, uh, on, on these questions, much more sympathetic to the views of African Americans and racial justice issues um, than, are, than are white Christians. Um, so white Christians are really staking out the higher end of that, um, staking out the higher end of that scale. That's uh, that that's absolutely fascinating. The, the... Did the European use his faith for spiritual worship or for the social control of his belief in manifest destiny? Does the color of Jesus matter to the white Christian? Does the Bible specifically use the word race? in any of its writings. Clearly, the purpose and experiences of religion between black and white are polar opposites. How is this racial pattern of behavior connected to politics? On the next episode, we will explore some parallels between religious history and the political evolution and current state of our country. Make sure you catch part two of this episode, Race, Religion, and Politics, The Polygamy of Ideologies. In the meantime, take some time for self-reflection and consider how you may be using your ideologies of race, your faith, and your politics in addressing today's concerns. If you're interested in learning more about my work on racial deconstruction, you can find my works on Amazon. And I am also available for personal consultation. Please continue to follow this podcast as together we continue to deconstruct race.